is supported by archaeology. Now, there are many things that we can look at to show that the Bible is true. Archaeology is just one of them. We can look at science, we can look at prophecy, we can look at experience, and we can look at archaeology. And there are many other ways we can look at the Bible and examine it for ourselves and be satisfied that this is what it claims to be, a holy book, a separate book, a book from God. Now, before we look at the archaeology, I just want to just look at one line of evidence from the other three, just to show different fields which we could have looked at to support the Bible. So, with the science, it's a very simple passage which talks about the children of Israel had to circumcise their children on the eighth day. And there was this great insistence in the Bible, it had to be on the eighth day, and on the eighth day only. It didn't matter whether that day was a Sabbath day. They still had to circumcise the child on the eighth day. And one might just think, well, that was just a quirk. But what science has shown us is that that eighth day was the ideal day for performing that op operation. Because vitamin K, which is important to the clotting of the blood, only is present between the fifth and the seventh day of a baby's life. The other thing that you need for clotting blood is prothrombin, and again, on that eighth day, and eighth day only, it reaches its highest level. And so the eighth day, it turns out, is uniquely right for this operation. This was written to Abraham 4,000 years ago. Abraham had no knowledge of these things. But today we can see, uh, there's the graph of the uh, prothrombin it just reaches 110% on the eighth day and then drops down to its normal level. Vitamin K is only present from seventh day onwards. So eight day, uniquely right. Uh, and so there is just one example of how science shows that the Bible was written by God. God who created babies uh, and created this extra burst of prothrombin. Prophecy is a fantastic subject because it covers so many different aspects. But uh, one of the insistent things that the Bible prophets talk about is that though the Jews, God's people, will be scattered from their land, God will bring them back. And they will come back not to any old land, but back to the land of Israel where their forefathers were. And we're just going to look at just one passage. And in Ezekiel chapter 11, God spake this. Thus saith the Lord God, though I have removed them far off among the nations, though I have scattered them among the countries, yet I have been a sanctuary to them for a while in the countries where they have gone. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples, assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And that's what we've seen in my generation. The state of Israel has been set up. I put down experience, because this is one of the things that show us the truth of the Bible. Uh, and the many in this room will bear witness to the fact that the Bible has transformed their lives. As they've got to know what the message of the Bible is all about, it has had an influence on them. It has a change of their outlook. They're now certain of where they're going. They know what is going to happen in the future because God has spoken. And experience is, is a great asset as we read the word of God. And it gives us that assurance that this is the word of God. Right, so to our subject, archaeology. And what we're going to look at is a, a time period between Abraham 4,000 years ago to today. And just using the clock to denote that uh, 4,000 years King David was roughly a thousand years after Abraham, and the Lord Jesus was another thousand years ago uh, after David, and of course the Lord Jesus was uh, about two thousand years ago. Now, just to put things in their context, have any of you been to Sutton Hoo and seen the Sutton Hoo treasures? Anybody here? Well worth going. Well worth going. But their treasures, which are considered very ancient in this country, 
Uh, I'm going to have to put them on the clock about there. They belong to the uh, 6th, 7th century AD, and we think those are ancient. But what we're going to be looking at is a time period from King David to the Babylonian captivity about 600 BC. So we're going back in time 3,000 years to 2,400 years. So very ancient things. So we start off this morning, this afternoon, this evening even, uh, yeah, um, with the city of David. King David took over the Jebusite city and uh, enlarged it and built his palace there. And this is uh, Brother Lane Rittmeyer's reproduction of what he thinks that uh, Jerusalem looked like. He is constantly revising this picture in the light of archaeological remains. And uh, I've just had to purchase this picture because my other one was uh, quite out of date. But, so this is the latest uh, of his pictures showing Jerusalem. Let's uh, uh, look and see where it fits in on the map of today among Jerusalem. The city of David, this is looking from the south, roughly fits that area there. Now, the first item I want to look at is an inscription that was found last year. Uh, this uh, Dr. Elat Mazur will be a name that crops up frequently. She is a very active archaeologist in Jerusalem, and she's done a lot of excavations there. And last year, in one of the excavations we're going to look at, she came across this shard of pottery, um, just to mark it up, and they believe that this goes back to pre-David times because this isn't Hebrew, this seems to be a Canaanite text on it and so would date back to the time when it was owned by the Jebusites who were Canaanites. And that agrees with what the Bible tells us, that David conquered the city of Jebus and it then became his headquarters when he became king. So here is a very ancient uh, find which supports what the Bible says. It wasn't uh, an Israelite city from the beginning, but they conquered it, they reconquered it. So back to this uh, drawing of the city of David, if we just uh, enlarge it, uh, you can see the wall around it, uh, an area here, a tower, big tower, and then up there, a uh, the city of David, the palace of David, which he constructed on the top of the hill. Now, what's of interest is that supporting buttress, as it were, which uh, is quite casually mentioned in the Bible. Uh, so David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David, and David built around about from Milo and inward, so from uh, Milo. Um, backwards inside the city. Now, Milo means a rampart. And until, you know, 100 years ago, people didn't really know what it meant by Milo. But uh, the area was fully excavated um, in the 1970s and 80s. And this is an aerial photograph after they had fully excavated this um, Milo, this infilling. It was first discovered back in the 1920s, and then Catherine Kenyon in the 60s uh, excavated a bit more. But uh, Yigal Shiloh uh, did the majority of the more recent finds. And that's, as I say, as it was all uncovered, and it's now been turned into an area which one can go and see the place there. Uh, we'll come back to this picture a bit later on. But in the past 10 years, they have concentrated their archaeological digs to the area on the top of this hill. Because the reason, well, if the Bible is true, David built this in order to have his palace, then we would expect to find David's palace on the top of this rampart, as it were. And this is uh, what it meant by building from Milo and inward. And so that what they were expecting to find is something like this. Uh, that rampart supported was very steep hills, and so in order to construct a palace, David had to build extra fortification in order to build something on top. And in the past 10 years, through the excavations on the top, 
I have found that that is indeed the case. I have traced a palace, um, and that this stepped stone structure, as they call it, supported what they call the large stone structure on the top. And uh, the, uh, the archaeologist, Mazar, uh, presents evidence that the large stone structure is indeed um, a palace, a wall palace, being used from the uh, time of 10th century, which is King David, right through to BC 586 when Jerusalem fell. And so she says, well, all this is, is part of one massive work that was done. And we believe that this was the work of King David, uh, who built this in order that he could have his palace on the top. Now, these are pictures of the work on the top. These were in the early days. Uh, you can see some of the sizes of the rooms that they found there. It's now covered over, and one can go around these um, excavations and see the palace that was there in the time of King David and onwards. Now, archaeologists too have been working at the bottom of that stepstone structure. This has been ongoing for years and years, and it has been quite a puzzle as to make sense of what is down the bottom there. But now with further excavation and hence the alteration to this drawing, they now find out that this tower here goes back to Jebusite times before King David. And King David incorporated that tower into his uh, enlargement of the city. Now the importance of that tower is that it's covering over the spring, the spring Gihon, which supplies Israel with its water, or Jerusalem with its water. So by having it inside that tower, it meant that the Jebusites and those living in the city at that time were quite confident that uh, they were safe from siege because their water supply was inside the city. In fact, the Bible tells us of how they mocked David and said, you'll never be able to come and take the city, it's impregnable. But the Bible tells us that David did manage to take the city um, and uh, the Jebusites were driven out and, as I say, David uh, incorporated uh, existing walls and buildings into his works. And Jerusalem must have been a, a wonderful place in the time of David and Solomon because uh, from the Gihon Spring, running into pools and running down uh, streams, going into this, these gardens here so that fruit could be grown, must have been a, a wonderful sight to see the irrigated city of Jerusalem. Now, the name David has at long last been found. Um, well, at long last, this is 20 years ago, but comparatively to uh, 3,000 years ago. This is a, a stone, an inscription, which was found in the north of Israel at Tel Dan. And in the uh, letters uh, there, it, it speaks of the house of David. Uh, there's a transliteration of it. So, the house of David. So, this confirms that there really was a man called David, and he had a house, a dynasty, like the house of Windsor. Um, and this was a wonderful confirmation that David really did exist and was responsible for a lot of the work there. Now, his son Solomon greatly extended the city of Jerusalem. And again, this is uh, the Lane's latest drawing of the Jerusalem of Solomon's time. You can see David's city ended there, and Solomon constructed this huge wall round with towers on it. And filling in the top of the mountain there, was able to build the temple, Solomon's own house, and various houses up there. A massive work because the, the stones are huge that were used, employed uh, to do that work. And so that is what the scripture tells us. When he made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord, the temple, and the wall of Jerusalem round about. That's not referring to the wall that David had made, but this new wall going all around the um, extension 
to the north. Now, the whole area was greatly reshaped in the time just prior to the Lord Jesus when King Herod uh, pulled down the existing buildings that had survived over the centuries and um, built his own temple there. And today that has been replaced by the Dome of the Rock. Now, in the circled area, just to the south, uh, or all to the south of the temple, have been a lot of excavation work. But uh, Dr. Ilat has been working on that area there. And what she found greatly excited her because here was a link going right back to time of King Solomon. We found two sections of a city wall, one 70 metres long and 6 metres high, and the other 35 metres long and 5 metres high between the city of David and the southern wall of the Temple Mount. Inside the walls we found the remains of a 6 metre high gatehouse, a royal structure adjacent to the gatehouse, an 8 metre long and 6 metre high corner watchtower built of carved stones of unusual beauty that overlooks the Kidron Valley. And uh, that's part of the uh, corner of the watchtower. Um, these are the, the guard chambers and various things there. So this, she dates back to the time of Solomon. This is part of the uh, corner tower. You can see the size of the blocks in relation to the lady. Um, and here was part of Solomon's work. And this was greatly exciting because, as she explained, there have been other findings from King Solomon's time period in Megiddo, Hatzor, Giza, but never before in Jerusalem. And this makes the findings very unique and very exciting to me. And now the whole area has been turned into an archaeological park and uh, one can see the discoveries that she has made linking back to the time of King Solomon roughly um, 3,000 years ago. In addition to that area there, she has also been very active in this area here which uh, used to be a car park and she came up with the thought that underneath this car park I will find remains of things that go back to David and Solomon and she was quite right. Uh, they brought in equipment which showed that underneath the car park there was indeed a lot of buildings, ancient buildings and eventually the Israelis agreed and the car park was all ripped up and uh, great excavation works uh, have been going on there. Now, one can go down, they've gone down 35 feet uh, in the layers. And you can go underneath all of this and find layers which go back to the time of David and Solomon. And they found a water channel that ran from the Temple Mount down through this area, down to the south of the city, to a huge pool that they recently discovered where they believe that the Jews, when they were going up to the temple, would wash to be purified before going up to the temple. So what we're going to do now, we're going to jump from 3,000 years ago to the time of the Babylonian captivity, when all the work that David and Solomon and succeeding kings had done was all swept away, when the Babylonians came along and destroyed the city. What we've been looking at in fairly general terms, and I don't think anything of what I've said will convince you of the truth of the Bible, it's just, well, it, yes, it does seem to match, but what we're now going to do is to take one chapter uh, and we're going to see how the detail of that chapter is abundantly proven by the spade of the archaeologist in a way which I hope will convince you, just by taking this particular detailed examination, will convince you of the wonderful truth of the Bible. But before that, we need a bit of background. We're going to be talking about bullae. Bullae are clay seals. When you had a scribe have an official document, when he finished the document, he would roll it up, flatten it, fold in the two ends, wrap some string around it, put a dollop of clay on it, 
and the scribe would have a special ring, which was his sealing ring, and he would press that into the clay, and in a short period of time it would harden, and then that could be stored away in the library. And that seal would tell you who was the owner of that particular document. Now, normally the clay bull eye just disappear in time, but the Bible tells us that at the destruction of Jerusalem, when the Babylonians came, they burnt the city with fire. And so we've lost all the documents that were stored there, but in a wonderful way it has preserved these clay seals because he baked them in the intense heat and has enabled them to be preserved down through the centuries. So that's what the bull eye are all about. Uh, the reference that tells us, uh, one or two references, but I'll just put one of them, um, having besieged the city, having taken the city, then the king's uh, commander, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, came back and burned the house of the Lord, the temple, the king's house, the houses of Jerusalem, the houses of the great men, and burned he with fire. And as a result, the official treasure um, storage records office, as it were, burnt with fire, but the clay seals, many of them, were preserved. Now, this is typical of one of the rings that will be used to impress the owner's name upon the seal. Our Hebrew is normally right to left, but the seal is left to right, so that when it is pressed in the clay, you have the mirror image. And this particular one is one belonging to Hanan, the son of Hilkiah, the priest. Only scribes or high-up officials would have rings for sealing documents. They were the only ones that were involved in uh, such matters. So to find a ring was somebody of high estate, and this one was the son of Hilkiah, who was the priest. As the next slide explains, you know, it says on there to Hanan uh, of Hilkiah, the priest, and showing you in ancient Hebrew and modern Hebrew. Uh, and that's the impression that the, the seal would have left. Now, the interesting thing to us is that Hilkiah was a priest, is mentioned in the Bible. And we're going to be taking a reading from Jeremiah, who was also the son of Hilkiah the priest. Jeremiah was a prophet as well as a priest. And so that the seal would belong to his brother. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? Here we're going to be looking at a, a passage in uh, Jeremiah, uh, and we have a ring from the brother uh, of Jeremiah himself. And the room where these seals were found was called the Bull Eye Room because uh, of all the seals that were there. So remember the photograph I showed of the stepstone structure? Well, this is just moving round a bit. Uh, and this gentleman is, is looking at some ruins built into the stepstone structure. Um, interestingly, what we have there is one of the oldest uh, lavatory seats. Uh, it's been tipped up, obviously. It will be uh, horizontal when it was uh, in use. Um, but. Uh, that's uh, in this house of Ahiel because of an inscription that was found, <clears throat> so they call it the house of Ahiel. But at the feet of this man, if we just go to the drawing there, um, is the Bulai house. And this is where the seals were. This was the official library for all these documents. Uh, and the other place there is termed the burnt room, again evidence of fire, evidence of arrowheads, um, and one can see some of the arrowheads, some of them quite beautiful really, this is a bronze one, They're clearly Babylonian from its style, um, with, um, oops, with uh, a hollow in there, so go on the end of an arrow. The Babylonians made good use of arrows, uh, axe heads and uh, a spearhead there. Now, so that was Bulai and where the Bulai were found. The other thing we just need to know just a little bit about is the, uh, the kings of that time period. 
And the last of the good kings of Judah was Josiah. He died in battle. There was great lamentations over his death. And uh, he had three sons. And uh, the middle son was chosen to be king, Jehoahaz. He only lasted three months. Um, when Pharaoh Necho from Egypt came and replaced him with Jehoiakim, the eldest child of Josiah. And he was king for 11 years. Now Nebuchadnezzar, we're going to be talking a bit about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, comes along, takes Jerusalem, takes Jehoiakim, and puts his son Jehoiachin on the throne. He's only there for three months. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar comes back and uh, removes Jehoiachin off to captivity to Babylon and put Zedekiah on the throne and his king in Judah for 11 years. At the end of his reign coincided with the end of Jerusalem because Jerusalem was besieged and taken by Nebuchadnezzar and Jerusalem fell. Zedekiah had his eyes put out and was taken to Babylon as a captive. So this is just the time period and we're going to be taking a reading from Jeremiah chapter 36 which revolves around this King Jehoiakim. So I'm just going to hand back to Ian to read the first 19 verses of Jeremiah chapter 36. Now it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take a scroll of a book, and write on it all the words I have spoken to you against Israel, against Judah, and against all the nations, from the day I spoke to you, from the days of Josiah, even to this day. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the adversities which I shall purpose to bring upon them, that everyone may turn from his evil way, that I will forgive them their iniquity and their sin. Then Jeremiah called Barak, the son of Neriah, and Barak wrote on the scroll of a book, at the instruction of Jeremiah, all the words of the Lord which he had spoken to him. And Jeremiah commanded Barak, saying, I am confirmed, I cannot go into the house of the Lord. You go, therefore, and read from the scroll which you have written as my instruction, the words of the Lord in the hearing of the people in their Lord's house on the day of fasting. And you shall also read them in the hearing of all Judah who come from their cities. It may be that they will present their supplication before the Lord, and everyone will turn from their evil way. For great is the anger and the fury of the Lord, as pronounced against this people. And Barak, the son of Neiah, did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading from the book the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. Now it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord to all the people of Jerusalem, and to all the people who came from the cities of Judah to Jerusalem. Then Barak read from the book the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord, in the chamber, in the chamber of Gemara, the son of Shaphan, the scribe, in the upper court at the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house, in the hearing of all the people. <clears throat> when Micaiah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Shaphan, heard all the words of the Lord from the book, he then went down to the king's house into the scribe's chamber, and there all the princes were sitting. Elishamah the scribe, Delaiah the son of Shemaniah, Almathan the son of Akbar, Jemariah the son of Shaphan, Zedekiah the son of Hananiah, and all the princes. And Machaniah declared to them all the words that he had heard when Barak read the book in the hearing of the people. Therefore all the princes sent Jediah, the son of Nethaniah, the, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Cushi, to Barak, saying, Take in your hand the scroll from which you have read in the hearing of the people, and come. So Barak, the son of Nehemiah, took the scroll in his hand, and came to them. 
And they said to him, Sit down, man, and read it in our hearing. So Barak read it in their hearing. Now it happened, when they had heard all the words, that they looked in fear from one to another and said to Barak, We will surely tell the king of all these words. And they asked Barak, saying, Tell us now, how did you write all these words? At his instruction? So Barak <coughs> answered them, He proclaimed with his mouth all these words to me, and I wrote them with ink in the book. Then the princes said to Barak, Go and hide you and Jeremiah, and let no one know where you are. Thank you. So that's a long and complicated section, but it does have a lot of names in it, and that's the reason why I chose to have this uh, chapter read. Because these are people that existed, we believe, and the Bible is true, these are men and women who existed 2,000 400 years ago and we can see from archaeological evidence that many of these names really existed they were real people and I think this is a wonderful confirmation of the word of God so in verse 1 we told about the king Jehoiakim the son of Joseph <coughs> uh, we're also told that Jeremiah was involved and verse 4, we're told of the name of the scribe who was summoned to write down these things, Barak the son of Neriah, and we're told he was a scribe. And then in verse uh, 10, we have this uh, official uh, who was called Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the scribe. So there's another scribe. And uh, then in verse 11, we have Micaiah, the son of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, so uh, this is Gemariah's son, Micaiah. Then in verse 12, we have four new names. We already have got Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, but there are four new names. Elishima, the scribe, Deliah, the son of Shemalah, Elnathan, the son of Atbor, and Zedekiah, the son of Hananiah. And then in verse 14, we have this man, uh, Jehudai, who was an official, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Shalemiah. And then uh, we didn't actually read, but if you've got your Bibles, we'll just read verse 26. Um, they, they read the scroll to the king. The king doesn't listen. In fact, as uh, the scroll is read, he chops it and burns it in the fire, such as this evil king dismissing the word of God. Uh, and in verse 26, the king, having heard all these words and having burnt all the roll, calls uh, four of his officials to come and arrest uh, Jeremiah. Verse 26, the king commanded Yeramiel, the son of Hamalek, Seriah, the son of Aziel, and Shalemiah, the son of Abdiel, to take Barak, the scribe, and Jeremiah, the prophet. But the Lord hid them. So uh, we have these people mentioned in that verse. So in, in total, we have 13 names in this chapter of the Bible. Let's see how many of them we can confirm from archaeology. So Jehoiakim was the king. Now, unfortunately, I can't produce any evidence for Jehoiakim. But we know from the Bible that he had a son, Jehoiachin, who succeeded him. And we know that he was king because uh, in Babylon has been found a clay tablet, which is in fact the meal allowance from King Nebuchadnezzar to Jehoiachin and his family, saying what their allowance every day would be. Uh, and it makes it clear that this was an allowance for Jehoiachin, who used to be king in Israel. So, although I can't get you to Jehoiakim, his father, uh, at least we know that his son did exist. And uh, going back to Israel, again, we have a seal, which uh, may or may not be uh, the same people, but uh, it's quite conceivable because of the 
uh, age of which this dates back to, this is the property of Eliakim, the steward of Jehoiachin. So again, you would need to be fairly high up to have such a seal. So it looks as if Eliakim was a steward of Jehoiachin. So I'm afraid I fall down somewhat at the first hurdle. I can only get uh, an indirect through his son for the first one. But Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, we've already looked, haven't we, at that seal, that ring, rather, um, and that was of Hanan, the son of Hilkiah. So we know that Hilkiah existed as a priest, uh, as recorded here. But this is where things hot up. Uh, the scribe who wrote these things, we can show you not only his seal, but we can show you his thumbprint. Now, there are not many ancient people that you can show the thumbprint on, but we can on the next slide. So, this seal says, belonging to Berechiah, the son of Neriah, the scribe. Now, in Hebrew, it was quite common to add the name of God, Yah, uh, to a name. This is Barak, the son of Neriah, the scribe. Now, it's exactly what the Bible tells us. He was a scribe. He was Barak the son of Neriah. And if you want to see his fingerprint, his thumbprint on this other seal that has been found, you can see the remains of his thumbprint. Well, say, what other ancient character going back two and a half thousand years can we say we have their fingerprints? So, yes, we've got confirmation. Barak, he was the son of Neriah, he was a scribe. That seal confirms it. And verse 10, Gemariah, the son of Shaphan the scribe, we have a seal belonging to Gemariah, the son of Shaphan. So the very person mentioned there, uh, it doesn't say he was a scribe, but because he has a seal, we can be reasonably certain that when the Bible says he was a scribe, well, yes, that makes sense, because scribes are the main people who have these seals because they were writing the documents. So, Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the scribe, uh, we can't find anything for Micaiah, but he was the son of uh, Gemariah, the son of Shaphan. Now, in verse 12, we have a list of four new people. And again, Elishama, the scribe, we have the seal. Uh, Fraser's not a very good picture, it's in uh, private collector's hands and he's not keen on having it taken and that was um, taken many, many years ago, that's why it's black and white. But it says, Elishma, servant of the king. Now, when a seal says servant, don't think of servants as in Victorian times, that word for servant indicates an official. He was Elishma, an official of the king. And again, that's exactly what we read in Scripture, that he went, he was in the king's house, and he was the king's scribe. So he was the official scribe to the king. So again, that is confirmed by that seal. Now the other three people there, uh, we have no knowledge of. And uh, in verse 14, Jehudi, the son of Nathaniah, uh, we have no record of him. But when we get to verse, sorry, I jumped too far. When we get to verse 26, Jeremiel, the son of the king. Now, uh, in the authorised version, in verse 26, it says Jeremiel, the son of Hamlet. But if we've got a marginal reference, it will say or of the king, Jeremiel of the king, the son of the king. And that's exactly what this seal says. Yeramiel, son of the king. So that exact wording, as the scripture tells us in Jeremiah, it is what is found on this seal. As I say, belonging to this time period when Jerusalem was besieged by the Babylonians, which was a few years uh, after this incident in Jeremiah chapter 26. And uh, we've got Shemiah, the son of Abdeel, and uh, we haven't got a seal of his, but we do have a seal of 
we assume is his son, can't be 100% certain of it, but there is a seal which bears on it, Jukal, the son of Shalomai. So going back, I'll just underline that Shalomai because we can't be 100% certain that it was the same person. But Jeremiah, the son of the king, we certainly can highlight that. So out of these 13 names, we've got direct references to Barak, Gemariah, Elishma, and Jeremiah. So four of those we've got direct references to. Implied references, or at least we can say, well, these were names which were common at that time to Jehoiakim and Shalemiah. But we've also got the confirmation of their genealogy. The Bible goes out of its way. It doesn't say Barak. It says Barak, the son of Neriah. And that's exactly we find that is true. And Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, we know that is true. Uh, and Jeremiah, the son of the king, we know that is true. And also we have this confirmation of their positions that Neriah, Barak, is described as a scribe. Um, Shaphan, uh, Gemariah, is described as uh, a scribe. Um, and Jeremiah is described as the son of the king. So in all the detail that is in that chapter, the chances of, in any other situation of finding out of 13 people all these links, I would submit, is pretty remote. But because this is a record of truth, we believe that this is wonderful confirmation. That Jerusalem was besieged by Babylonians, was burned, seals were preserved. These names have been, provided, been preserved over the years. So we have this uh, amazing witness to the truth of the Bible. So I think that's pretty... Amazing that 2,600 years ago we have all those characters uh, brought before us. Now, if we just turn over uh, probably a page in your Bibles to chapter 38, we have four officials who are sent to kill Jeremiah. Jeremiah at this time is uh, not in hiding, not in prison, he is preaching. And the king's servants say to the king, look, you've got to get rid of this man. Jeremiah is saying this city is going to fall to the Babylonians, and therefore you should leave the city and fall to the Babylonians. Hand yourselves over to the Babylonians. If you want to save your lives, get out of the city. And these men said to the king, look, it is undermining the moral, morale of the people. Get rid of him. And so, uh, in verse 1 of chapter 38, we have these uh, four officials, Shephatiah, the son of Matan, Gedaliah, the son of Pasha, Jukal, the son of Shalemiah, and Pasha, the son of Malchiah. And uh, in verse 4, they're described as the princes. Again, when the Bible talks about princes, uh, not necessarily princes as we think of princes as a direct descendant of the king. This is a term that covers officials. So these four men uh, were to go and take Jeremiah, and in fact they did. They arrested him and put him in prison. But again, these, out of these four names, we have confirmation of two of them. So that's a 50% hit. Geneliah and uh, Duke. We have got the seals of these men, Jugal, the son of Shalemiah, and Gedaliah, the son of Pasha. So two of these four, we have found seals, or archaeologists have found seals in Jerusalem, going back to this time to confirm the authenticity of what the Bible speaks about. These people really existed. This is incredible confirmation uh, of these things. Now, these two seals were found in that car park that we looked at on the map, um, where they're still busy ticking away. And uh, they were found about five years ago. They were found within 30 feet of each other and found within a few months of each other. And again, it bears testimony that area that was being excavated was 
part of the government buildings area because when Solomon built his house to the north, uh, the house of David would be turned over to other uses by the government. Uh, and so it's not surprising that these officials were found, uh, their seals were found, having been dropped in the dust and forgotten about, um, found in that particular area. Now, we turn over another page to chapter 39. We have the actual fall of Jerusalem. I'll just put it up on the screen there. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, on the ninth day of the month, a breach was made in the city, and all the officials of the king of Babylon came and sat in the middle gate. Nergal Shereza of Shamgar, Nebuz Azikam, the Rab Saris, Nergal Caesar, the Rab Mag, with all the rest of the officials, officers, sorry, of the king of Babylon. So they took the city, uh, and these Babylonian hierarchies stood or sat in the gate of the city and dictated what was to be done. Now, in the British Museum, are thousands and thousands of clay seals. 130,000 clay seals taken from Babylon. Many of them have never been read, and researchers to this day are plowing through them. And back in 2007, seven years ago, um, a Viennese professor was busy reading through these seals. And when he was reading this seal, <coughs> interpreting the cuneiform, he recognised that name, Nebuzar Zikim, which was on the record in, Deuteron in Jeremiah chapter 39. What this little clay tablet is all about, is it's found in Babylon, and uh, this particular gentleman, uh, Nebo Sarsikim, uh, he was given this clay tablet as a receipt for a payment that he had made to a temple in Babylon. <coughs> and so uh, we learn from this that he was the king's chief eunuch, Nebuchadnezzar's chief eunuch. And therefore it makes eminent sense that the chief eunuch of Nebuchadnezzar would be with Nebuchadnezzar at his side when he broke into Jerusalem uh, and was there carrying out the king's orders uh, at the time of that conquest. So here again is another confirmation, a name of a Babylonian eunuch who has been preserved in a clay tablet, lay in the dust of the earth for centuries, millennia, now has been read and matches the name that is given here in Jeremiah chapter 39. I want you to put all that against this background that merely 200 years ago Babylon didn't exist. 200 years ago, scholars doubted whether Babylon ever existed. The only record could be found in the Bible. Critics used the story of Babylon and what they call its non-historic kings as described in the Bible here, to discount scripture. However, Babylon was discovered and excavated in 1898. We know today that Babylon was one of the first cities in the world founded by Nimrod, according to the Bible, the great grandson of Noah. Archaeologists have found Nimrod's name in many inscriptions and tablets, while the massive head of Nimrod has been excavated near Calmley on the Tigris River. The Bible tells of the Tower of Babel and how the language of mankind was confused there. Archaeologists have found that the inhabitants of ancient Mesopotamia had a popular habit of building towers called ziggurats. Almost every city of importance had at least one. So again, I put that up because until comparative recent times, people said Babylon, it was just a myth, some made-up story by the Bible writers. 
Now we know that Babylon was indeed the city that it spoke of, being very important, being one of the first cities, the Bible tells us, growing to its zenith and uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the power that took uh, Jerusalem as we've been looking at these chapters in Jeremiah. So there are many amazing finds, and we just looked at a few of them. And I hope it will convince you that this book, the Bible, is the most important book of the world in the world. And we owe it to ourselves to examine its claims, to test its claims, to read it, to find out what it's all about. And I hope that you will join us in seeing that this is indeed the book from God. His instruction of how we should lead our lives, how we should walk before him. And it gives us a wonderful hope that the Lord Jesus is going to come back to this earth and establish the kingdom of God upon this earth. And Jerusalem will be exalted as God's city. And all nations will come and worship God at Jerusalem. And this book contains a hope for you and me and anybody who will listen that we can be with the Lord Jesus in that day, to be his helpers, to bring about this time of reformation, this time of peace, when the earth will indeed be the paradise that God intended. And so if you can, come along to our meeting room in Oliver Street, just down the road, on Sunday at 3 o'clock, we're going to be looking at the land of Israel and see what God's promise is all about uh, to the nation of Israel and how his plan and purpose is being fulfilled and the things that are happening around us today. This is God's book. Make it your book.